this interview conducted by Sky Video, Jet Loving, Director of the Institute of Network Cultures at the Amsterdam University of Applied Sciences, the Netherlands, speaks on the inspiration for his book, Networks Without a Cause, a critic of social media. He tells of his frustration that the internet has become too centralized to be effective and is therefore calling for a return to the original format. Jet also answers questions on alternatives to social media monopolies and how they might be set up to make them competitive. Just sit back and enjoy the short video. Reading through your book, Networks Without a Cause, a Critic of Social Media, I get a sense of despair running through all the chapters of the book. What, in your assessment, is the biggest challenge facing the internet, and uh, how do we make the internet to work better? Yeah, the despair comes from uh, the realization that um, um, the, uh, the world cannot be changed uh, through uh, the lens of, uh, of the media and uh, the usage. and. Um, I'm from a generation that, uh, you know, put a lot of um, hope and emphasis on the question of representation, on the question of um, maybe uh, empowerment, self-empowerment, uh, the question of, um, you know, getting the message across to, um, to find... Um, Truth in the, in what we um, transmit or, um, or record, publish, print, um, and um, of course there were certain hopes in the nineties that uh, the rise of computer networks would uh, bring a shift in the in the in the power relations. Um, because uh, you know they were coming from um, from below, and um, um, yeah, what we now see is kind of a repetition and uh, a, a re-centralization, if you want. Uh, the whole uh, cloud computing is a very good uh, example. Um, in the past, maybe you know people wouldn't uh, have thought. Why the hell, if you have computers and computer networks, why would, would you again make that same mistake and centralize all these facilities? You are clearly in favor of setting up alternatives to social media monopolies like Google and Facebook. How can this be achieved, knowing full well that these are classic capitalist establishments? Well, I mean, on the hopeful side, we know there is a hype cycle and we know that... Um, you know, uh, companies like Google uh, come and go. A company that these days would look uh, tremendously big, um, you know, like um, the ones maybe in the 1980s, where we hardly know uh, their names anymore, right? So, um, yeah, it's possible that uh, they disappear and uh, very a very uh, recent example is, of course, MySpace, which uh, for so many years was much, much bigger than uh, than Facebook, right? Uh, we, we people, young people, wouldn't even uh, know uh, what MySpace is or was for that matter a couple of years ago. So the fact that a company is big and um, a very powerful in itself. Uh, should not uh, frighten us. Um, what we can see with um, uh, the, the strategies of, of Microsoft, uh, Google, but maybe also Amazon, Apple, and all the rest is uh, that with the capital they uh, they gain uh, and uh, gather, uh, they start to uh, diversify very quickly. The most recent example of that is uh, Facebook. Right now, we still associate Facebook with the social network. But it's very likely, uh, within a few years, uh, that uh, you know, they will just be a, a media uh, conglomerate. So if, we want, if we're talking about 
alternatives to face uh, to Facebook or, or Google, usually we activists, artists, programmers, designers refer to uh, let's say alternative variations of the known platforms. Right? If we're talking about an alternative to Google, we mean uh, you know a, a search engine. Uh, without all these commercial biases, a search engine that would be based on other uh, algorithmic uh, principles and so on, right? Uh, an alternative to Facebook would mean uh, a social network that is truly local and uh, doesn't work with this ridiculous notion of uh, friends, you know, um, uh, uh, as a general principle to connect people. How might these alternatives to social media monopolies be set up in a way to make them flourish and competitive, given what the likes of diaspora are experiencing at the moment? Yeah, with alternatives, uh, I have to say that uh, it is not necessary that uh, they, nec you know, they reach uh, one uh, or 1.2 billion people um, overnight, because this, uh, this model is anyway based on a, on a very uh, violent venture capital model of hyper growth at all costs, right? Where the, where the investments are made with the sole purpose to grow and gain a, a critical mass, uh, thereby uh, pushing aside competitors. So uh, the, the hyper growth model of becoming very, very big um, is in itself a problem. And uh, and is one which I hope uh, you know will uh, will go away um, because uh, we're not necessarily benefiting uh, from from that. It's it's us the users who uh, in fact pay the price for, for that. We are not gaining anything. Yeah, that we know. There is another uh, uh, issue because I think what uh, a lot of people uh, would like to see is that we have other. Uh, protocols and standards on the on a much more basic level and if we're talking about alternative social networks a lot of activists are focusing not so much on that level of the application or of the website or something like that no the alternative eventually for billions of us will be on the basic level the one the, the level that we won't even see and that's the level of the protocols, the standards, uh, and and there uh, we can let's, let's uh, say uh, that's where we can uh, subscribe these values into the network mode uh, itself on a technical uh, level, and on top of that, we can then have a variety of much smaller social net social network. We know. You know, for you and me, and for for many many people, has a maximum of 150 uh, members. Uh, after that, it becomes uh, quite uh, quite hard to track what's going on. You lose uh, oversight, and and really, your network uh, is in fact even much much smaller. So now, funding is a key issue here. What sort of funding arrangement do you think will work for these alternative social media platforms? In terms of public infrastructure, I don't think that uh, there will be uh, a global solution. So um, it's very, very hard to imagine uh, how that would work um, because we've got. S in terms of public infrastructure, I don't think that uh, there will be uh, a global solution. So. Um, it's very, very hard to imagine uh, how that would work um, because we've got hundreds of nations and uh, they're all in very, very different um, circumstances. They have different uh, backgrounds in terms of religion, culture, mm, you know. So, the, uh, um, so the, 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 but of course, there can be uh, a global fight for for public. Uh, infrastructure that's possible that's, but the outcomes maybe uh, can be very different from from place to place and uh, some would maybe prefer some kind of subscription model um, where others 
uh, would say, well, the, the public infrastructure needs to be given by the state because we're already paying tax. Uh, others would say, no, uh, that's not an obligation of the, um, of the state. Uh, we, can, uh, we can run it ourselves, maybe in, 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 in the form of uh, co cooperatives or um, uh, others would say, no, well, maybe let, let's look at the, the model of the libraries, for instance how libraries are run, and then um, maybe even piggyback on, uh, on that, right? Uh, some libraries are, you know, as you know, they're free. Uh, some uh, ask an annual uh, subscription fee. So, uh, but in the end, uh, yes, I believe that, uh, you know, it's necessary to think along those lines because otherwise, we, we will just remain in the hands of the Facebooks and Googles who are going to define, you know, who we are. You believe that media studies research has lagged behind developments in new media and therefore you call for a divorce. Can we completely divorce the study of social media from cultural influences? Um, yeah, I, I believe so because um, uh, the, uh, the dynamic of these um, let's say, um, IT, computer and the network technologies, um, they is, the, 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 it's so powerful that um, at, certainly at the moment uh, it is going beyond the classical questions of representation. And media studies has limited itself conscious to that realm. Why? I don't know. It was not you know, my choice. Uh, I think there's more to the world than uh, the question of representation. Um, but um, media studies uh, has limited itself to a very, very rigid set of notions and um, concepts that come from uh, classic film and television and remain in those realms. And uh, that is uh, unfortunate. And I think the, uh, the world of new media you know, it's now really moving on. A lot has been said about the democratic credentials of the internet. How viable are social media as communication and organizational tools for social and political act activists? At the moment, uh, the internet is uh, not very good uh, at uh, organizing people on a very, very basic uh, level. What we see in the social movements and the uprisings that uh, happen uh, across the globe from uh, the so-called Arab Spring, uh, the Occupy movements to um, Madrid, Tel Aviv, Bangkok, uh, Kiev, uh, you know, the list is uh, growing and growing. Um, that um, once uh, the, the movement has started, a certain form of uh, mobilization uh, can happen. Um, in fact, in a, in quite in a, in, a, in a late stage, in, in a way when, when the event is already unfolding, um, social media come in and they also play a very, an important role at that particular moment in uh, informing people uh, across the globe and, and in particular the, the uh, growing importance of diaspora. As we know, uh, these com uh, computer networks, these social networks, uh, can also be used in much, much earlier stages. At the moment, that's way too dangerous. And many, many uh, activists, uh, you know, for very, very obvious reasons, are not doing that. But for, uh, let's say, diverse grassroots movements uh, ac across the, the, the globe, in fact be a very very good thing to build up over time sustainable networks let's say networks of networks right and where a social movement can at some point also be an accumulation of those smaller networks at the moment that's out of the question huh? it's too dangerous and also the uprisings that we see happening across the globe they occur way too fast right out of they, 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 the whole uh, move, uh, the, the mood in society is growing and growing. The despair is growing, and then suddenly, right, 
it, it, it explodes, right? And this and this um, uh, mode in which um, the uh, discontent uh, boils over and and then uh, you know um, flows in the streets and uh, riots occur. It might be an appealing. Uh, model, but uh, for social movements, in fact, it's not the preferred model. One of the major things you treated in your book is, of course, big data. Given Edward Snowden's expose and what we now know of government surveillance, who should be the most worried, data owners, governments or corporations who trade in data? Right now, certainly, uh, it's the people who should be most worried, because maybe we uh, feel you know, certain strengthened by all the revelations of uh, WikiLeaks, and then all the actions of the anonymous movement, and uh, and then uh, since June 2013, all the um, uh, uh, activities that are related to the uh, findings of uh, Edward Snowden. Uh, but um, yeah, if we if we don't translate this discontent into uh, a strong movement with uh, with political um, agendas uh, that both work against state surveillance uh, and corporate uh, domination um, and uh, and is also focused on uh, the desire or articulation of how uh, an alternative network architecture could look like. Because uh, we cannot only protest. Uh, we know that the technology is going to stay with us. So uh, we urgently also need to think uh, of how we want to do it um, uh, otherwise. Because Reading through your book, it sounds to me like you are techno-pessimistic because your arguments sound very much like those of Evgeny Morozov and Neil Postman. Are you of the same school as these callers? Okay, uh, yeah, uh, in 1995, together with Pitt Schultz and many others, well, we set up the, the NetTime mailing list. At the time, it was meant to uh, strengthen, uh, you know, the cultural, political, um, artistic ties to uh, the, the more technical uh, agendas, right? And I think this is uh, uh, my answer to the to the techno pessimism. Uh, uh, I strongly believe uh, that um, uh, that we have to team up with um, with startups, with uh, with programmers, um, and that we need to insert uh, a political and a cultural agenda uh, there. And, and, and that's maybe different uh, from the, the tr traditional uh, techno-pessimist point of view because, um, uh, in a way, uh, I'd say that the scene where I come from, we see ourselves as developers uh, of the network. And we know that this um, uh, environment is very fluid. It's not a given. Well, we can say, well... You know, uh, Google is an immensely powerful uh, monolith. Uh, uh, yeah, but we also know it consists of code, uh, and the code can be rewritten. Uh, you know, um, we can come up with something else, or they will, um, right? We can put a lot of pressure on them. Um, so, um, yeah, my uh, my European, uh, let's say, uh, European pessimism. Uh, is a is a gay one. Is a is a. I I have tremendous joy in this negative uh, critique. I strongly believe in the positive value, uh, in the constructive value of ruthless uh, radical 